And the name of the joint presentation is Cultural Exchange and Connectivity Through the Visual Arts and the Accompanying Rule of Private-Public Partnerships. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very, very warm, warm welcome for Mr. Lucien Perkins. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> it's a, a pleasure to be here. And in, in the spirit of cultural diplomacy, my wife and I decided to uh, do a presentation together for, for the very first time, I think, actually. So this is uh, very exciting. Um, Mr. Dunphy said something earlier. He talked about how the, um, the world needs, the story of the world needs to be told to, to, the, to the U.S. And uh, I've been very lucky as a um, photographer for the Washington Post for 27 years to do just that, to cover the world, to cover the events, um, to meet uh, many of the people. Um, I don't know if you can see these images or not. Um, uh, and um, I think what, what, what I came away with was the importance of meeting people, meeting other cultures, and interacting with them. Um, and, but I also found the importance of telling their stories. And that, that's something that, as a photographer for the Post, I had the ability to do, uh, was tell the stories of people in Siberia, in Sudan, in Yemen, in Russia, uh, um, but also what I found was the, the amazing response that photog photographs have, because photographs have this unique ability to transcend all cultures. Um, you don't need to speak the language to understand photographs, uh, because they're capturing a moment that tells something about, e something in each one of us that we all identify with. Um, I remember when I first started to look at photographs, I was in high school. No, actually I was in junior high school, uh, looking at the photographs of the Vietnam War, um, the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, all these photographs influenced me very heavily. And I was absolutely convinced um, that there wouldn't be another Vietnam War. I mean, how could you have a Vietnam War after the images that we saw? Um, but we did. Um, so I realize that photographs aren't going to change the world, they're not going to stop wars, uh, but they can make a difference. Um, and uh, one of the photographs that I took, for example, in Bosnia, um, a young woman, actually a friend of both Sarah's and I, came up to me and she said, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but when I was in high school, I saw this photograph you took in Bosnia, and she said, it moved me so much that I decided uh, that when I went to college, I was going to somehow work with Bosnian artists. And she did that. She, she actually uh, created an exchange program uh, and brought Yugosla uh, former Yugoslavian artists from Serbia, from Croatia, from Bosnia to America. Um, so photographs can influence people. Um, another story that I did in Kosovo uh, was a photograph of a, a young girl, I think I have it here somewhere, um, who was executed. Uh, her whole family was executed in front of her, including her, except that she lived. The bullet pierced her cheek uh, and she played dead. Uh, and when this photograph ran, a surgeon in Washington flew her to D.C. and uh, performed plastic surgery on her. Um, so photographs do make a difference. Um, when we bring the world to America, it can make a difference. Um, and, uh, and that's something that's uh, certainly that I've become more and more interested in. Um, one of the things that uh, I decided to do, I spent a lot of time in Russia, and I realized that you know each one of us has a profession, something that we can give back to other people and to other cultures. And as a photographer, uh, that's something I, I, I learned I could do in Russia. I first went there in the early 90s. And one of the things I learned was there were all these great Russian photographers and they were totally unknown to the rest of the world. Um, and as a matter of fact, Western newspapers, magazines would send people like me to Russia to photograph it rather than hire a photographer from Russia. 
And so what we did was we put together a photo conference in Moscow. Um, it was called Interphoto. And um, uh, uh, <coughs> we brought in curators, photo editors from, from around the world. They looked at the, the work of these Russian photographers. And lo, lo and behold, a year later, they started hiring them. Uh, one of the photographers won a $20,000 grant. And literally, uh, about a week before, we were having dinner with him, and he had to sell one of his cameras just to put food on his table. Um, so we can make a difference. Uh, because in, regardless of what our profession, if we reach out uh, to our colleagues around the world, um, I want to jump back a little bit. In the in early 2000, uh, a writer, Bob Kaiser, and I did one of the first uh, blogs uh, in 2001 for the Washington Post. And we traveled throughout Siberia. And every day, we posted stories about where we were. <clears throat> At the time, this story got more hits than anything the Washington Post did. Um, and what happened was is we started getting letters and our emails every day from people in Russia saying, you got to come here. you got to do this. And then we would get emails from people in America asking us what we were seeing, what we were doing. So we created this dialogue. And um, I mention this because uh, this is 2001. Today, with blogging, with the internet, uh, with Facebook, actually, uh, which you brought up earlier, there's so many ways that we can communicate. Um, and we have the technology where many of you can take photographs uh, with your iPhones. I'm starting to shoot projects with the iPhone. It's amazing the quality of it. So you yourself can become the cultural emissaries and, and tell your stories and interact and connect with people around the world that share your stories, that share your profession, that share what make you, makes you special and what you can offer. Um, so that's, uh, um, and these are just some of the photos and, and places that we went during this trip. We also did this in Finland. Um, and the reason we went to Finland was because uh, it has a lot that we can learn from uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the green in industry, how the industry works with the ecology, uh, their education system, their medical system. So that's what we traveled around. This is what we could learn from Finland. And we had the same response. Um, so there's many ways today that we can all interconnect and, uh, and reach out to the world around us. And to it, not only to reach out, but to learn from them and to learn from ourselves. And this, this is uh, what I was talking about earlier about uh, Interphoto uh, that we did in Moscow. You know, when we first started this in 1995, it was all sort of older white men. Uh, and, and by the end of 10 years, it was mostly uh, kids in their 20s and, and easily 50% were women. Um, And with going back to, to the interconnections, many of these people I'm constantly in touch with, you know, five, 10 years later because of things like Facebook. Um, so we have better ways now to stay in touch, to keep connected, and to build these bridges um, that, are, that we so desperately need to do. Uh, and to use what we have uh, as ambassadors and our, as I, I keep saying again both my both my wife and I are lucky because we're individual fields but it doesn't matter um, each one of you has something that you can impart as well and and connect with as well and I think I'm going to leave that uh, leave it to that and and uh, introduce my wife Sarah Tanky. hi everyone I, as I was listening to the talks earlier this morning, I realized that both Lucian and I are talking more from the grassroots level up as opposed to 
the policy makers and hopefully that's going to trickle down somehow. And I'm really pleased, Mark, for having this opportunity to talk about Arden Embassies. It's really not that well known in the United States because all of the work we do is overseas. Um, I'm going to start with a brief overview video. So I'm going to go through this very quickly now, and I want to concentrate uh, the rest of my talk on a few specific examples of projects that I've worked on. And a quick correction, I'm one of seven curators. I'm not the curator, and I've been there since 2004. And the other thing that's really informed my life is that I'm a foreign service kid. So in my life, I feel like I've come full circle. and. I'm, you know, my father pro was probably negotiating arms deals under the table, and I'm negotiating art loans above the table. Um, as the video pointed out, we have four areas of concentration. We curate. Our, one of the one of my primary jobs is curating uh, temporary exhibitions for select U.S. ambassadors' residences, and. Um, we're really uh, totally global in scope, and I think back growing up as a kid, how many countries were in the world, and now it's 180 plus. It's so um, the scope of Arden Embassy's reach is really huge now, and it gives us an increasing opportunity to um, not just broadcast U.S. art and U.S. power, i.e. soft power, but we're encouraging ambassadors more and more to include works by local artists so that when you go into a U.S. ambassador's residence now, you're going to see works by both U.S. artists and host country artists. And we also, when we have our initial meetings with U.S. ambassadors, we ask them to start thinking about themes that will resonate and take their cue from the host country, whether it's their culture or burning, you know, it could be child labor, could be ecological issues. And then my task and my, my challenge, but it's also my passion, is to find artworks that will help not just illustrate that theme, but take it to another level of understanding and dialogue. 
Um, since 2005, we've also been putting together permanent collections for new U.S. Embassy buildings as they're constructed all over the world. This policy was initiated after the bombings in the late 90s of U.S. Embassies. So initially our new U.S. Embassies looked like fortresses, but we've gotten rid of that concept. And the ones that are being built as we move forward uh, also take into consideration the host country uh, T the tradition of uh, architecture, but also culture. So the look of the building and then the art that we're curating uh, is definitely more not just saying, hey, it's the United States, it's our way, look how great we are, but it's creating a dialogue. And we always, when we're doing our permanent collections, we always include works by the host country. And they're almost exclusively contemporary. That's certainly, just speaking again as a foreign service kid, I think that's one of our core values, the United States core values, is that we encourage youth, entrepreneurship, freedom of expression, and um, I think emphasizing contemporary art as opposed to art of the past is a way of, of just signaling that. It's a, it's a, we also do these uh, multilingual companion publications, and now that we're in the 21st century, we post them on our website as well as on embassy websites. And this definitely works in countries where they have access to the internet, um, but you know the, that hard, the actual printed one works in countries where they still don't have this kind of access. Um, since 2002, we've created these, this artist exchange program, and there we send our artists who are already participating either in an exhibition or in a permanent collection. They go to that host country where their artwork is on view, and they conduct workshops, educational outreach programming, and increasingly they're actually partnering with local artists and local universities to create a work of art that will either go on temporary view at the U.S. Ambassador's residence or become part of a permanent collection. Um, and I just hear my very quick examples. Um, and you know, typically, uh, well, I'm going to give you examples of ambassadors who wanted something a little different than a typical art and embassies exhibition. In Wellington, um, Ambassador Hubner said, "Look." What I want to do is for you to find an, LA, an emerging LA artist, because that's where I'm from, and I want you to find a partner, a New Zealand emerging artist, and together they're going to become curators of the Art and Embassies exhibition. I said, that's great. I love doing, I mean, I think that's an excellent idea. So we, we arrange for the US and the Kiwi artists to do their studio visits together. They came up with 10 works. They each got so enthused about the project and they, the theme was encountering place and how do you define place. And they, they, so they each created their own works of art, brand new for the ambassador's residence. But the funny thing here is um, when I finally presented the, the checklist, the illustrated checklist to Ambassador Hubner, he goes, I hate everything. And I'm like, oh my God, we can't have this international uh, scandal. And I worked on them and, and I asked the artist to explain uh, their individual selections as well as their, you know, their artist perspective. And I, he came around very quickly and then he became a huge fan of his exhibition. Uh, the, the second example is, um, Donald Booth, Ambassador Donald Booth in Addis Ababa, who wanted to get at issues of freedom of expression um, that, are, that currently exists in Ethiopia without directly using any kind of hard power or har harsher power, harsh power. So he decided to hold a competition w uh, partnering with the Art Academy in, uh, Sari in Addis Ababa and based on the four freedoms. And these four works I'm highlighting because they were first on view at the U.S. Ambassador's residence in Addis Ababa, and then because I was the lead curator for the permanent collection in Addis Ababa, I, I put them into the permanent collection. Um, and then segueing to a couple of permanent collections I've had the privilege of being the curator for. In Sarajevo, as we all know, um, they would had some pretty uh, brutal wars and they had the siege in Sarajevo itself. And what I found there uh, in uh, meeting and researching uh, the contemporary art scene is that the artists were still very much feeling the wounds of the, uh, of the war. And their artwork was pretty dark. Um, and it became a challenge for me to how to 
not necessarily put a you know, Spielberg spin on the collection, but come up with some positive ways of talking about art as a tool of healing. Um, but I, I start you off with this particular example, which titled Basics, and, it, and this is her a quote, this is her artist statement, and she talks about the three things that she most needed and that her fellow, um, the people that stayed during the siege, what they most needed um, during, the, during that time. I also wanted to get artists from different ethnic groups represented, and I had the good fortune of already knowing this DC area artist, Eric Finzi, and when I was doing a studio visit, he told me about how his family, had, you know, his Jewish heritage dating back to the Spanish Inquisition, so I put one of his paintings um, in the collection, and I don't know if you can see it, this is part of a series where he has the globe. Um, as the featured metaphor, and here he substituted the globe as th for the basketball, and he titled the painting Hover. Uh, we also have, were able to do an outdoor piece, uh, it's on the embassy grounds, and here because the time was short um, and Chris Doyle did not have an opportunity to do a site visit, he contacted and he identified and contacted four Bosnian artists and the uh, Bosnian artists went out to the surrounding mountains and forests, took photographs and video and then he incorporated them into the, the glass panels that you see there um, on, this, on the interior parts of this wooden structure which he called social structure too. Uh, moving on to uh, Liberia, to, which too, of course, has had a, a history of very brutal civil war and um, its infrastructure is still pretty much on the mend. Um, I wanted to um, emphasize issues uh, related to education, recycling. They have one of the world's last untouched rainforests that's, you know, a lot of uh, world powers are having, the, you know, they're eyeing very carefully as well as offshore oil. So um, I found, it's hard to see this, um, but I found um, an artist, Doug Bub, who uses altered books as his medium. And what he's taken here is a, is a um, dictionary and reshaped it into the shape of a mask. Liberia has a long tradition of mask making, but I didn't want to include actual masks uh, by Liberians in the collection because the different tribes that make these masks still don't like each other. Um, they also have a really, really rich uh, tradition of quilt making, which uh, really got started when the former, you know, the freed slaves went over in the uh, 19th century. So I have examples uh, of both the traditional kind of quilt that, you, you know, you can see these kind of quilts being made, the, uh, probably still in the United States, but they were, their heyday was in the 19th century and what they're doing now, which is incorporating village scenes. And the cool thing about the uh, National Quilters Association, it really had its roots as a way to empower women. And they came about and decided to create this organization um, as a way to show girls that there's something else besides violence, uh, something positive that they can do. Uh, and then in answer to that, I. Wanted, and I found this incredible quilt by Mary Fisher. She has AIDS. She travels all around Africa doing programs relating to AIDS awareness. And she titled, which is hard to see, it's sort of an iconic woman. Um, and she titled the piece Amazing Grace. And, and you can quickly sort of read what she says in her artist statement. And finally, I just want to, this is an excerpt from my catalog essay, uh, which is going to come out in a couple of months and will be posted on our website. And I think it talks about the transformational role that the individual artwork and artist, and again, as Lucian said, all of us can play, and uh, establishing a sense of trust and respect. I think, you know, just the idea that the U.S. is now not just showing its own art overseas, but showing our art alongside our partnering countries sends out a, a huge message of respect, and that's how we can sort of create a platform for this international cross-cultural dialogue. Thank you. <laughs>